Good afternoon, everybody. I really appreciate you uh, coming out middle of the week here, um, lunchtime. Uh, spend it with us. That's uh, uh, really important to us, and we, we're really grateful. Um, so my name is Ben Sigman. I'm with the firm Economic and Planning Systems. Um, I'm going to be joined today by Steve Lawton, who's with Main Street Property Services. We're consultants to the city working on this uh, Valco Special Area Specific Plan and advising on real estate markets. And obviously, we're dealing with a mall here, and so we, we really wanted to have a deep dive on, on retail. And so that's uh, largely why Steve is joining us. He, he spends day in and day out thinking about retail and malls these days. And so he, he's going to be a wealth of expertise uh, that we can bring to bear. And, um, what I'd like to do today is um, give you a pretty brief presentation, and then Steve's going to do this deeper dive on retail trends, uh, get the juices flowing, and then I think we'd like to spend uh, at least half the time, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we'll get this done in a half, 20 minutes or a half hour presenting, of presenting, and then, um, and then really do q and I was here on Monday night and uh, did this breakout discussion after the presentation, and it was really rich. I was really thrilled to uh, engage with many of you I see in the room today. Uh, folks have some great ideas. You know this area well, you know this site well, and um, it was just a, a great conversation. I'm hoping we can continue that today, so I hope to be quite interactive. Um, just really quickly, the firm I'm with, Economic and Planning Systems, about 35 years of practice in real estate, public policy, regional economics. Um, the, the slide you see here shows many of our core competencies. This kind of work, uh, specific plans, assisting cities, assisting developers as well, uh, uh, sort of our, our primary business. Um, and I, I am based out of Oakland and do all my work in the Bay Area, lots of work in Silicon Valley, as well as San Francisco and the East Bay. So uh, just a kind of view of, of your fine city, um, I've called it cosmo cosmopolitan enclave. I don't know if that, that's fair or not, but um, about 60,000 residents here in Cupertino. And just looking back over roughly 10 years, about a 6% increase in population, so very modest kind of population growth. And um, you know, we looked at some of the, uh, the surveys that the city does and, and saw some, some very positive things. Almost nine out of 10 residents are satisfied with the quality of life here in Cupertino. And schools um, in particular, our reason that, that families and, and individuals choose to be here. So these are your priorities. Um, it's been a rapidly evolving economy, though. Um, 40,000 jobs, essentially, today on the ground here in Cupertino. And it's really a, a headquarters location, as you well know. We have Apple, a globally uh, known firm. We also have Seagate and others. And it's not just Apple, but Apple's certainly the, the big dog. Um, and this, this growth in jobs, I think, is, is part of the reason we're having such a rich conversation about this site. A 50% increase in jobs over roughly 10 years. It's just a really dramatic statistic, and that's borne out by State of California employment data. Um, and when we look at the commute patterns, 90% of those jobs are folks commuting in here. So uh, while you, know, you all are enjoying quality of life and great schools, you're sort of you know, you're, you're accepting in a tremendous number of people on a daily basis to work here. And that, I think, is, is affecting quality of life. And we see that in, this, in the surveys that the, the city does. Um, traffic and development are your number one concerns, which is why I think this, this planning process has been so well attended and, and why it's so important that we continue to talk about how to grow appropriately uh, here in Cupertino. Uh, location, location, location. Uh, you, you're sort of blessed and I maybe, maybe in some of your minds cursed, right? Uh, you're right in the middle of, of Silicon Valley between um, San Jose, where lots of people live and work, and, and Palo Alto, where the venture capital flows and the intellectual capital uh, you know, largely originates. And, and all uh, are surrounded entirely, Sunnyvale, Santa Clara, Mountain View, by very rich employment areas and, and sort of sprawling uh, residential communities. And so um, not only is the city sort of centrally located, well located to attract real estate development, but this site is particularly well located to attract real estate development. I've got a few quotes here. Uh, right out of your general plan, there was some market work done. Um, best located property in the city and one of the largest redevelopment opportunities. Okay, and that again, why we're, we're so focused on, on trying to get this right. We're going to talk more about retail later, but I wanted to do a couple of quick slides. Um, retail is, is evolving rapidly. We're all shopping online more. Uh, while it's not uh, the, the second point there, a huge percentage of our spending, um, it's, it's changed so quickly. You go back to just before 2000, around the dot-com period, uh, less than a percent of, of retail shopping was occurring online. We're now at uh, seven, over 7%, and that's not even the newest data. That's from the... Uh, 
the um, Department of Commerce, Federal De Department of Commerce. Uh, so pretty believable statistic. And, and so again, while, you know, while maybe that 7% isn't mind blowing, the, 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 the rate of change is. Um, and then retail stores are suffering, and it's, it's, Steve's going to speak more about this, but the, these department stores in particular, um, 9,000 closings uh, in 2017. I think I misspoke on Monday night. It's the three stores here as well as a number of other retailers that have closed these 9,000 establishments. Um, okay, and then I want to talk a bit about the graphic. You know, we have a, a great location at Valco, but when you look at the other uh, super, what we call super regional malls, you can see how close they are, and, and these are the malls that are thriving and that we're all shopping at now. And so we're, we're really sort of covered in terms of retail, and, and Steve and I will talk more about it. But in the U.S. overall, there's just a tremendous amount of retail uh, per capita as compared with Europe and Australia. Something like, you know, I think it for, Steve, you may have this stat in your presentation, but something like five times the retail square footage per capita than we see other sort of mature economies in the world. So. Uh, challenging environment for new retail. But we do see retail uh, investors evolving their strategies. Um, we've got a shot here of New Park Mall, which is up in Newark on the 880. Um, and this is a mall that, that didn't die. Uh, it, it's got its anchors in place. And just to stay relevant, they're adding food, they're adding movie theaters, they're changing the look. It, it feels like a, a place for the, the current generation to spend time, and, and they, that's what they're trying to do. They want you to come in, enjoy yourself, stay. Length of stay is huge. And so it's not just a place to do your shopping, but a place to spend your time. And then the, the shot below is Hilltop Mall up in Richmond. This one is suffering. It's struggling. It's, it's lost a, an anchor as well. And they're, they're innovating entirely in that they're bringing new uses to the site. A tremendous amount of housing, um, as well as changes to the, to the makeup of the mall itself. They're going to take one of those anchor boxes, the, the physical real estate that I think J.C. Penney used to be in, and turn it into a parking structure, because it, it's just not going to be a department store ever again. Um, they're also finding new anchors. They're going to use a Ranch 99 as an anchor for this mall, and with that comes a tremendous amount of Asian-influenced retail and restaurants. So it's just a very different strategy, and that's what it's taking. Uh, in addition, a lot of um, services are going to go into this mall, so your, your, um, your doctors and other sort of professional services you might need. Okay, let's talk about housing. Uh, housing crisis is the term that the, the media uses, and I think we're all feeling it. We maybe get an email from Redfin or, or Zillow telling us, you know, X or Y about uh, the house we live in, and it kind of is, is mind-blowing. Or we're evicted from our apartment, and we look at the rents out there, and they're, they're astronomical. So that, you know, that's, that's what I think people are feeling um, around the Bay Area. And um, it, it really is a, a lack of a supply from an economist's perspective that, that's at the root of this. I mean, uh, there are, you know, there's areas that gentrify and prices get run up. But for the most part, uh, housing, new housing project, uh, the supply of units on the market aren't keeping up with the job growth. I showed you some of the numbers earlier here in Cupertino, 50% uh, employment uh, growth and 6%. Uh, population growth, it, it just is that, it's out of whack. And, and that, while it more, more sort of pointed and dramatic here in Cupertino is an issue uh, barrier-wide, um, we looked at the housing permits in the city, and um, there has been permitting. There, there's new, new units coming online. Um, a lot of them are single-family units. It's, it, it's, it, when we look at the, the county uh, as a whole, we see that, that multifamily units here aren't, aren't the same proportion of housing permits that are being issued. And so that there's an opportunity there to maybe shift the kind of housing in the city to, to sort of provide more uh, and, and more affordable housing. Um, and just another statistic that we look at is this, this jobs housing balance. I know some people were talking to me about it on Monday night. Uh, you do have a lot of jobs per working resident. We use uh, data from the census and, and look at jobs per working resident. 1.6 here versus 1.1 uh, countywide. It's over three in Palo Alto. So by no means is this, are you the worst off in this regard. And having a lot of jobs in, in many communities would, would be you know, all they could ask for. But I understand here it's creating some, some externalities, some, some friction. Um, and just, uh, you know, when we look at the, the jobs out there, while there, this is a headquarters location, and there are very, very, high, what I call as an economist, high value jobs in the economy, there still are, are all types of employees. So even though it's a high tech company, they still need administrative folks. They still need janitorial services. And so there's demand at all price points is what, what we say. It's, it's not just uh, luxury housing that's needed. And there are different, um, there's different thinking, but for the, you know, do, do we bring 
you know, bring housing at all price points or do we bring housing the, that the market demands and, and free up some other units? I think that from an economist standpoint, bringing any new housing supply will, will help um, stabilize prices. Um, I wanted to give a couple of examples of, of housing. You, you, you all are probably pretty familiar with the, the relatively recent projects you have here in town, uh, 19800 as well as the residential project in, in Main Street. So I thought I'd show you a couple from nearby. They're, they're similar um, in a lot of ways, but, but I also think one thing to point out, so we've got an example from El Camino Real in Mountain View, another one from the Sunnyvale City Center area. Um, four to five stories, subterranean parking, pretty decent looking um, apartment buildings, pretty well integrated into their surrounding. Um, what, what's interesting about these, I think, as compared with the data we have on the projects here, they're, they're a little more compact. These units, uh, 900 roughly square feet per unit. Uh, here, they, we, we see them coming in a bit bigger, and you know whether that's zoning or that's a desire of the, the developer to try to target a family market, it's a, maybe a bit of both. Um, but I think there's, there's an opportunity here for slightly more compact housing on this site and something we, we might all consider fitting more into less. And this is, you know, these types of units, it's 9, 925, 870, that's the average. So that might be a, a two bedroom or something like that. I mean, you know, so in these buildings, you're gonna have studios for a young professional. You're also probably gonna have some larger units for families, but, but I think if we can get that average down, we can fit some more units in, that might be a good thing. Um, on office, uh, just a tremendous amount of office development throughout Silicon Valley uh, coming out of the recession. 23, roughly 23 million square feet in the county. It's, it's kind of a mind-blowing number. But what, what's also uh, equally astounding is the degree to which the companies have gobbled it up. So coming out of the recession, the county had something like 17% uh, vacancy in its office space. Delivering 23 million square feet, uh, we, we've not only, we've absorbed that and more. We're down to 10% vacancy. So um, pretty healthy market. I, I sort of put my healthy threshold at about 10% and, and, and we're there. And um, there's a lot of office space in the pipeline, more than 20 million square feet of office planned. Um, but when we consult with the brokers and we, we, we take the pulse of the market, uh, it's, it's really insatiable uh, at this, you know, and, and the economy will turn and these, these perceptions of, of, of you know, the, the need for this space will turn, but everyone uh, I think today is still thinking this is all quite healthy and, and will continue to, to evolve. And, you know, we'll continue to have to solve transportation problems to go along with that, but, but uh, these companies really want to be here. The, the talent is here, and the, the educated labor force is here. So this is um, prime location for office. And being close to Apple doesn't hurt. You know, I think when we look at office space at Valco, we think, well, that might be space for Apple, but there are a lot of other companies that want to be near Apple and serve Apple as well as these other headquarters in town. So it's, it's not just a one company game. Um, and uh, when you look specifically at Cupertino, 2% vacancy, right? So if you're an office tenant, if you're a startup company, you, you, there's really no way to get in here. Um, there's, it's, that's below what I would even consider frictional. The folks who are here are staying here and they're not moving. So uh, very challenging to, uh, to come in. And um, as a result, lease, lease rates are strong. And as I said, the, the, the location's really just, just great. Um, in terms of hotels, uh, Strong you know, performance in this market, 80%. That's usually the level we say, uh, actually 70% we'd say, you're ready for some new hotels, and, and that's what the market's doing. We've got one under construction in the Valco special area now, two others that are in the, the planning pipeline. Um, and so the, the market is responding to the, the, the strength of these lease rates, the strength of the occupancy. Um, it's really driven, this market, hotel market, by um, business travel. Uh, and we just, we can tell that because these hotels are really well occupied, uh, 90 plus percent during the week, and then it falls off on the weekend. So it's not a leisure location, but, but maybe it could be. Um, and then, uh, let's see, so I'll just quickly show you to, to kind of illustrate to a greater degree um, how sort of well, um, you know, it, sort of well satisfied the market is for hotels. And we've got the Valco site outlined here, and you can see where we not only have the hotel of 148 rooms within the, the site, but we're sort of surrounded. And so we're, we're feeling pretty well supplied for hotel, but the long-term outlook, if business continues to grow in Cupertino and the Valley, is that a, another hotel certainly could be part of the programming for the site. And so before questions and uh, discussion, what I'm gonna do is bring up Steve Lawton, um, as soon as I heard we were going to work on this, I called Steve. He was here over the summer um, for the speaker series 
uh, hosted a, a sort of discussion of um, retail trends with, with brokers and developers in the market, and I think um, really I highlighted a, a number of the challenges and, and opportunities, and we're going to continue to to discuss that today. So let me just bring up his presentation. Come on up, Steve. We'll get you on full screen. And like I said, after Steve, we'll, we'll start passing around the mic and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Hi, well, uh, uh, enjoy, uh, enjoy being, uh, being back in the Cupertino again, an extraordinary community. Um, so I um, thought, I would uh, suggest uh, or help, help with an understanding of what we see from the industry uh, in terms of trends in retail. Uh, as consumers, we, we kind of feel these trends, uh, and it's important to get the perspective of the other stakeholders in the, in the business. Um, I'd like to just outline a few points here today. Um, quick description of just the amount of retail space we have in this country, which is typical here in, in the Silicon Valley and the Bay Area. The impact of electronic commerce on shopping patterns, uh, which also impacts the size and shape of shopping. Uh, and uh, most importantly, I think the allocation of capital to retail real estate. Um, it's an, uh, for most consumers, it's an unseen force and so a little mysterious. Uh, and then the implications back in the, on the public policy side on land use decisions. Um, of how these trends are, are impacting our cities today. Um, you know, some folks typically kind of don't understand how the business works. Uh, the, the retailers are tenants in commercial real estate, which is owned by others. Uh, and there are different kind of tenants. There are big anchor stores like grocery stores and department stores. There are what, call, what are called the inline stores, the smaller shops. Uh, today, they typically offer uh, personal services. You'll find a lot of those, but a whole bunch of other, other kinds of retail are offered in the inline stores in shopping centers. There are national retailers uh, with the, the big names that are nationally promoted. And then there are local retailers with the, uh, you know, the smaller individual, um, uh, individual businesses. And uh, then there are the mom and pops and the, and the independents, the, the one-offs and the, uh, uh, that, that sometimes succeed and usually don't, uh, but, but can generate really, you know, really interesting uh, new, you know, sort of new potential and new ideas in retail. Um, U.S. retail sales is an astonishing number. It's $5.1 trillion. Uh, it's really the business end of the whole economy. Uh, well, business end of about a third of the economy is selling stuff to you. Um, so this is the final destination of a large fraction of all of the economic activity in the country is aimed at uh, getting you to buy stuff and selling you stuff and then dealing with it when you return it. Um, uh, tenant rents are, uh, so tenants pay rent and that rent reflects the demand for space. Uh, the, the rent has something to do with the cost of construction, but most of these buildings are reasonably long-lived. Um, so we begin with the basic rent for a square foot of uh, sort of old, maybe tilt-up construction. Um, and the, the base rent is a storage unit. What does it cost to rent a storage unit? Well, last year we looked, and in Mountain View, it was $2.37 per square foot. So a storage unit is a place where you put stuff and leave it. And it has very low operating, annual operating costs. And so kind of the, the, the base of a store shell is worth about $2.37, okay? Um, if you go to um, Los Altos and you, you figure out, find what, the, what some of the people are paying in rents there for store space, they're paying less than storage. Right? Which, which means that that property is less valuable than a place you store your old rugs. Right? That means that that location is, for various reasons, is less productive um, than uh, a place where you put, put your old stuff. Now, but it goes up, could go up to four and a half. Um, Castro Street, um, three and a half, four and a half. California Avenue goes up to $7.70. Dramatic changes based on the value of that space. And the value of that space is driven by 
the number of impressions you can make by the people, the number of the people that are walking by, its location, uh, and its location in the city, its location in relation to the other stores, which feed shoppers to you. Uh, and so uh, businesses are uh, making money, paying rent at $7 and more a square foot on the street, on street retail, which is unmanaged generally. Uh, the operating hours are not regulated. The parking is, you don't belong to the parking. And there are a lot of, a lot of conditions in street retail uh, that are different than shopping centers. Shopping center retail in Palo Alto and Mountain View is, last year we looked, it's uh, you know, four to six bucks. These are kind of regular numbers for uh, sort of suburban retail locations. And they, they spike up. You can, you can find all kinds of different, uh, different numbers. But this, these are kind of the numbers. So, but the point here is that the value of the retail space is driven by factors a little bit about the building, but mostly about the location uh, and, and the conditions around it that let you operate a profitable business in the space uh, at that location. Now, there was uh, something invented within the lifetime of, let's say, two generations back, okay, uh, called the shopping center, right? Shopping centers are a solution to the problem of the automobile. Uh, and there have evolved different types of shopping centers, and that evolution is actually quite recent uh, within our own lifetimes. This idea of a regional center is something that happened within my lifetime. Um, the specialty center, which is um, a, a, like a, uh, you know, the outlets or a, a particular line of, line of commodities that, that occur together. The enclosed mall, okay, which is a a big shopping, a bunch of stores with a roof over it. No enclosed malls have been constructed in the United States since 2000. Uh, the grocery anchored neighborhood center, probably the, the most common type where you have a grocery store and then a series of inline stores. The grocery store typically pays uh, very, very little rent, very little ground rent, and the inline stores pay, pay more. And so the business there is the inline stores benefit from the traffic, the anchor, um, just barely covers his costs. And then the freestanding retail building. They're all over the place, up and down. Um, you know, Wolf Road, any large arterial, uh, you can see freestanding retail buildings. And there are a variety of ownerships uh, and a variety of businesses. There's a tremendous amount of space in freestanding retail. They do not benefit from co-tenancy, um, but they operate very well because they're on high traffic arterials. They use advertising and other, mat, other means to get people to make a special trip to their location. And they're also uh, very convenient. You know, the, uh, the fast food, uh, uh, you know, just a range of commodities where, where you can just dive in from a, an attractive sign, dive in, make a, make a quick right turn and get there. And then there are the street retail districts. And this is where Main Street Property Services, the firm I'm associated with, um, operates, and these are uh, sort of the antique form of uh, the series of shops along, along a boulevard where uh, the uh, one shop plays off the, the demand of, uh, you know, for the next, and it's a pleasant place, and uh, um, it's very pedestrian-oriented. So uh, it's, it's important, I think, to, to kind of step back uh, and look at Look at how a, a shopping center, let's just deal with shopping centers for a minute, um, how they operate. And most, most consumers and citizens in a neighborhood very, get very concerned about how, shopping, how the, the stores look, uh, what are the stores, who are the tenants, what kind of goods and services are offered there. And that's uh, perfectly reasonable. Um, but your, uh, the, 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 the neighbors, the citizens, the consumers, the shoppers, the visitors really only see one side of, of what that firm is doing, okay? The firm owns, the, owns and operates the center, uh, and to, to borrow a little highfalutin management uh, consulting theory here uh, from Peter Drucker, uh, that firm is dealing with uh, a whole context in which it's doing business. And that, that context includes the legal, regulatory, and legislative environment in which it operates, um, the suppliers, uh, the, 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 the suppliers of, of um, shops and stores are really the tenants, okay? Um, it, it deals in a world of 
competition and that is other, uh, other shopping centers and other, other ways that people get their goods. Uh, so if you're in the, in the business, you're, you're paying attention to who's, who's competing with you, how the culture is changing, uh, and, and the, the sort of the whole social environment in which you operate. And then you also need to pay attention to how am I going to get visitors, shoppers, and, and everybody onto the property. So um, this, this is the business context in which these firms make their decisions. Uh, and these are, uh, uh, tend to be sort of long, long-term decisions. In that business, and there are a bunch of shopping center owners in the country, does anyone here own a shopping center? Does anyone here own commercial property? Okay. Um, for a variety of reasons, the tax law, accelerated depreciation, um, there's an important reason, uh, the Interstate Highway Act, there's a whole, you can write books of all the reasons why this is true, but America is overstored. Uh, shopping, we got, in between 1995 and 2015, the United States of America got 23% more shopping centers. Uh, we increased gross leasable area, and that's the area of the stores, by 30%, okay? And the population only grew 14%. So we're growing, we've grown retail for a variety of reasons, uh, much faster than population. Total retail space in the United States is 18 billion square feet. That works out to 55, a little more than 55 square feet per man, woman, and child in the country. Uh, now, shopping centers of that, shopping centers are about 23, okay. So, um, in Europe, they seem to run advanced economies, uh, seem to have a good standard of living, kind of a comparable. They get, they get away with 2.9 square feet. So, that's the environment. If you're in the shopping center business, that's the environment that you do business in, and that's the environment you live in. Uh, you have a tremendous oversupply, well, you have a tremendous large supply of competing product, uh, of your competition out there, uh, and, uh, you know, competing with your, with your location and your asset. On top of the tremendous supply of stores, uh, we now have this, this change. Um, since 2008, we have a, a change in how uh, household wealth is distributed and a change in how, how much household wealth is growing, which is much less than before. Uh, we have changing preferences as the, the generations turn over and tastes evolve. Um, good, you know, good little anecdote is in 2016, for the first time, uh, food service, that's uh, sales in in restaurants and, and uh, uh, restaurants of all kinds and bars, uh, food served to you in a store, the amount of money spent on that exceeded food purchased in grocery stores. So Americans are eating out more than they're shopping out. Um, here's a, a, a little, little piece recently from uh, National Restaurant Association. 66% of consumers, American consumers now say they're more likely to visit a restaurant that offers locally sourced food items, right? So there's, there's a, a new set of preferences, and this is, this is just life and society. These, these preferences constantly change. But now you're paying attention to a different kind of restaurant than uh, 5, 10, 20 years ago. And then the big driving force, of course, is this idea of, well, in the trade it's called omni-channel, the idea that you can actually buy something on the... Uh, on the internet, pick it up at the store. Amazon buys Whole Foods, um, and uh, this is certainly the big the big trend that's happening today, uh, which is you don't need stores anymore. Uh, well, you, there are bricks and there are clicks, and that's a whole other presentation. If you're in the business, it's a fascinating uh, set of scenarios that you can spin out. So the idea that there is, uh, that you can discover, you can, you can have, uh, discover the items on the online and that you can uh, buy them in the store, 
uh, is, uh, reduces the amount of, of retail space necessary, changes the character of the retail space, changes the value of the location of the retail space, and I don't know what else there is. It changes everything. So what's happened um, right here in this town, um, I, I brought my antique machine with me. I always like to bring my antique machine. This is a, uh, a Sony um, Magic Link. Um, it was invented by a company called General Magic. A bunch of the original Macintosh engineers um, invented this. Uh, they started a company in 1995. Um, I made the mistake of buying some stock in the company, bought the device. Um, but it has all the object-oriented programming in it that you'll find in an iPhone. It was kind of the precursor of the iPhone. So. Um, um, I, being a complete nerd, I, you know, I bought one of these, and it worked, you know, they, had, they were running for a while, and it was pretty neat. Um, but I bring it by not uh, r really to demonstrate how quickly things are, are changing. I mean, we have the iPhone now. The, cap the capabilities are, are moving very, very fast. Uh, and so it, it kind of feels like uh, this is sort of the first time we're, we're disrupting something, right? This is, we're living in times like none other. Uh, no other people have dealt with this kind of change before. Um, uh, you start out here. Um, there was a little bit of, of credit card stuff going on in that box. But you start out, if you look at, at the, the transaction, actually being able to buy something over the web, that was like a 1998 thing when I got the, the credit card, um, uh, uh, secure credit card transactions going. Well, that started. And then that brings in the idea of deliver, shopping and delivery. Um, and then, uh, well, the picture here is of the whole, sort of the whole customer interaction chain. So you start out by enabling the transaction. You go backwards to where, where can I buy it? That's the shopping piece. Before that, there is the discovery piece uh, where, you know, what is it? I'm buying a fire pit for my backyard. Where can I buy a fire pit? Lo and behold, there I can I can discover that online, um, and then before that, um, there's social media and there's all all kinds of ways that consumer tastes are invented. Why do I want to buy a fire pit? Why do I want to? Why is it that I have this consumer desire? So um, you look at that whole chain uh, after the transaction. Of course, you've got to return it because it doesn't fit. And that's an a interesting um, uh, break and an interesting friction point in developing these electronic commerce systems. And then you've got to do um, follow-on customer service. Um, and so more and more of these steps in the chain are being automated. Many of them have solutions now. And we're going to see continued, uh, continued evolution in, in, um, in how stuff gets uh, delivered to consumers, how consumers decide they want the stuff, uh, and, and how uh, consumers discover the stuff um, that may or may not involve physical stores. So if you're in the business of owning commercial retail property, um, this is a big deal. This is a huge deal. It's a threat to your business. Um, the, there are many different forecasts of the amount of electronic commerce that's occurring. Um, my uh, favorite, I'm just frankly borrowing here from uh, Cushman and Wakefield as the, is the best analyst of it, uh, Garrick Brown. Um, his forecast is 12%. Um, uh, we, we see that uh, Amazon has taken out uh, licenses to be, a, to be pharmacy, uh, pharmacy licenses in, in almost all of the, all of the states. Uh, we see mergers there where uh, pharmacy, you know, the next category that's going to, going to fall <laughs> is, is uh, pharmacy and healthcare. Um, so there's this relentless uh, move to, uh, you know, reduce these transactions down and change how, how consumers acquire their stuff. Um, the, the, the penetration by category is, is different, and that's a, again, that's another, another discussion. Um, uh, the, the big category of general apparel, furniture, and other, sort of the department store category, um, Amazon is eating that one very much. Um, the grocery category, uh, until the, the uh, Whole Foods acquisition, uh, was something that was thought to be sort of invulnerable, and now uh, Amazon has changed that, uh, changed that discussion completely. Um, 
And so by category of good, there's a, there's a different story of how electronic commerce penetrates that market and what the impact is. And that's, so that's going to be a different impact on the shape of our cities. So it's a, uh, you know, the, the term here is retail apocalypse. Um, Macy's is, is going, Sears is a zombie. Um, uh, all the big department stores that, you know, some of us remember are, um, are, are going away. Uh, and, but that was a store format. The idea where you can make on one journey, you can visit several different departments and they support each other in terms of merchandising and logistics and returns. That, that model comes together and then falls apart. Um, store formats are transitory. They really are. And the, uh, that has an effect on this, this idea of a shopping center, this form of shopping center. The International Council of Shopping Centers, which is the trade association of all the guys, it's mostly guys that own shopping centers, um, without a doubt, we are experiencing one of the most profound periods of evolution within our industry since the advent of the first suburban malls in the mid-1950s. There's no question about it. Um, we used to see photo mats, right? We don't see photo mats anymore. We don't process film anymore. There are city codes in California that regulate the construction of photo mats. So, um, it is important in, in going forward to pay attention to what, to what really matters sort of on a higher level of how retail, how people move around the city and what, what sort of your objectives are and what your goals are as a community, in my opinion. The responses, okay, so shopping center owners, you own a piece of property, it's in a city, it has some value, but your business is changing. Uh, you know, what, what are you gonna do? And it really, there's a variety of responses depending on sort of the nature of the shopping center you've got, uh, what, uh, what part of town you're in, and where you are in terms of your leases, your ground leases and your tenant leases with, with your store. Some of these big department stores own the property in the middle of the shopping center. And so the speculation is that um, a lot of tenants are just waiting around for Sears to fall and then when that business goes dark, then their leases can also expire as well. So watching Sears fall, you're going to watch a domino effect of a whole bunch of changes in a whole bunch of centers across the country, uh, like 870 uh, locations. So there are different responses to this. Um, the Hilltop Mall, I'm up at Contra Costa County, the Hilltop Mall example is a really good one of uh, repurposing the mall uh, around housing and around more of a uh, of a daily needs a, a grocery uh, center, uh, entertainment uh, is is frequently used as a, as another you know how do we get people to the property to spend time uh, spend time and spend money but also shop at the other stores. What, how are we relevant anymore if we're in this world of electronic commerce? Food halls is another interesting trend. Um, uh, merchandising, uh, merchandising is replacing filling spaces, more of an, uh, instead of leasing to whoever is going to pay the rent on that space, being, sh being very careful about what mix of merchandise that you put into your, into your mall. Um, the malls aren't dying, they're changing, um, but they're also dying. Uh, the earlier than three days ago, uh, Five Points announced that they're stopping work on a half a million square foot mall uh, at Hunters Point. They're just stopping. Uh, Mace Rich was the partner there. They pulled out. Um, they don't. Uh, they don't see a uh, kind of a future in it. Um, so there's uh, a it's a variety of responses in repositioning shopping centers, um, and. It kind of feels like we've never, you know, this is like new, new territory, you know, we've, we, how can we deal with this? This has never happened before, except it happened before. It happened in 1920. Uh, in October 1920, the Los Angeles City Council um, uh, put parking restrictions on downtown LA because uh, these new things called automobiles were crowding up the place. And that really started, that's really the root of, the, of the, uh, the shopping center in America as we know it today. So there were a lot of, lot of um, 
experiments with the form of the of the shopping center. And this is an early one where you'd have the different departments and you can just drive to it. It's kind of fun to see these old antique stores and then these larger stores happened. Uh, and there was a lot of experimenting done over the last uh, 70, 80 years of what the shape of these things look like. And that experimenting had a lot of implications, a lot of thoughtful people. Uh, this is a diagram uh, from 1927 of the LA uh, city plan, uh, the, uh, the board of city planning commissioners uh, trying to figure out what would be the, the best way to, um, to lay out a, a, an automobile oriented shopping center in Los Angeles. And some of these ideas gave rise to the forms that we are familiar with today and don't really think about how, how to go to the store. So uh, today in this, in this world of, of change, what does Wall Street, what, does, what do the investors look at? Uh, how do they view real estate as an asset? And what are the choices that they think they have? Okay? They're constrained by the legal regulatory environment, but they're also constrained by the environment of capital. Uh, where does capital go in this country? And it goes to places where returns are good based on risk. Um, well, there is no, there's a feeling on Wall Street right now that there's no worse investment than a poor quality mall. And this is right out of the uh, Urban Land Institute. Uh, there's the Emerging, Emerging Trends Report. It was last year, it's the same thing. Uh, uh, suburban office, power centers, and regional malls are uh, you know, fair to abysmal in terms of investment prospects. And at the high end, are urban high street retail and neighborhood and community shopping centers. So if you're going to invest in real estate, you have a choice of dozens of different categories to put your money. Where would you put your money? You would not put it into a traditional shopping center. So if you're looking, you know, if you if you're looking at what's possible to do on the site, on any site, you, you have to understand the forces and decisions and context in which that firm is going to be making its decisions and plan, plan accordingly. Uh, that firm is going to be constantly making a decision about whether to put more money in or not, or to transact the property and find somebody else with different preferences. Um, and it's going to be based on what the net operating income of the asset is, where you are in the business cycle, what are the construction costs and, and the risk of that cost, how long is it going to take to get approved. These are all the factors. So uh, the, the, the business now understands the following trends. Retail, supplies, retail space is oversupplied. E-commerce is significantly reducing the total per capita requirements for retail space in important categories. Is significantly changing the shape and function of retail real estate as uh, seen and felt by shoppers. Uh, the day of the department store is over. Owners of retail real estate are pulling back on new shopping centers and they're repositioning existing selected centers. And uh, shopping centers not built to serve daily needs, those are the grocery, store, grocery centers, will be seen as redevelopment sites or as evolving into new formats. This is the industry, there's just no question about it. Um, so at the industry conferences, this is taken as a given. Um, so this is where I get to show the slide of my grandfather in his pharmacy um, at the corner of Florence and Normandy in Los Angeles in 1923. And this is kind of the picture of what we all kind of harken back to as a community where you can meet your, meet your friends and get a, get a prescription from, from granddad. Um, and also to revisit some of the policy choices that city leaders needed to make uh, in 1925. Where will the workers live? They had a housing crisis. They had to f understand how to build suburban communities that would include all of the functions, including housing and shopping. And they had to figure it out. And that's, uh, uh, it, you, know, you know, kind of how we are today. Um, and, and so where we are today is that uh, as residents, we, we have placed, we have learned, been taught and learned to place some great reliance on retail, retail streets and retail and shopping centers as places that are amenities to the community. And the, the reality is that those amenities are available so long as the economy is in a certain state and growing. Uh, today, those, those centers and those retail places are under great stress 
great turmoil and transition, uh, and you really only can see it from one side of the equation, and that is, what is it, who are the tenants, what does it feel like to walk there, is there enough parking? You only see one side of that picture. Uh, there are other amenities in the community that, that uh, I believe in the uh, near future will, will rise in importance. Private amenities that are provided by homeowners associations and golf courses, uh, civic places and buildings which we have systematically underinvested in uh, due to Proposition 13 and so forth, uh, and then the legacy places, the wild places that have been protected uh, that are great amenities for, for especially in the Bay Area. So those are some other choices that uh, communities have. Uh, so uh, today we talked about the amount of retail space, the impact of co electronic commerce, the size and shape of shopping, the allocation of how allocate, capital gets allocated to retail real estate, uh, and the implications for land use decisions. So getting into the weeds. But this conversation is, uh, I'll just say that before we open it up, we've heard so much about retail and so much about the economics that this is a very important conversation, so we want to give the time. And I'd like to keep all the questions to retail and economics for this session. So uh, you're going to go around with the mic? Okay, and let one of these guys. Uh... Yes, sir. Yeah. So, and, and... Sorry, we're going to end up going long. I apologize. We did hope to respect your time. Sorry. No, it's okay. It, rich, rich oh. presentation. <laughs> okay. Uh, Gary Jones. I'm a 42-year resident of Cupertino. Um, my question has to do with risk management. When I look at the model that you're going through uh, with respect to the public, uh, you have these four components of retail, housing, entertainment, and office. How do you manage the risk with respect to the property owner coming in and making you know, a couple of billion dollar investment here uh, in relation to what the community wants? Because it seems to me that the community wants something that is uh, contrary to what the developer is moving toward, which is balancing the risk and the rate of return on his investment. OK, uh, definitely. A Good and challenging question. Um, so I, I think we are hopeful that as a, as a community and through this process, we can come up with alternatives that will be appealing to this, this developer owner applicant. Um, if we can't, uh, it's, it's probable that the, the site will not change. We, it's incumbent on us to come up with a a plan that, that is attractive to investors, attractive to the risk tolerance of this, um, this landowner or, or a future landowner. Um, so, so that's my first thought. The, the second is that when we're dealing with these, you know, 50 plus acre major redevelopment sites, um, a common strategy is phasing, okay? It's not as if we're gonna um, sink a shovel and then in two years open up this, you know, multi-million square foot facility. It's going to happen in small bites. So we're going to do a 200-unit housing complex followed by another 200-unit housing complex, or we're going to do half a million square feet of office followed by another 750,000 square feet of office. And that allows for the management of market risk and timing and cycles. Um, and it gets tricky when you're dealing with infrastructure. Sometimes there are infrastructure bites that are big at the beginning, and that, that that can be really scary. So that, that is something we'll be, you know, be looking at with our civil engineers as we think about planning the site. Can we break up the infrastructure a little bit to create reasonable bites that, that help manage risk? So those are a couple thoughts I have. For, for a housing developer on a given acre of land, you mentioned some 900 square foot recent projects. Is there an obvious driver to 900 or 3,000 What's the dominating number that makes a size they'll shoot for? Mm. Yeah, so, so um, real estate is um, a little bit old-fashioned and, and risk-averse to the, to the earlier comment, and so it tends to follow what's proven successful in a market, right? And, and here, I think with the, um, the profile of, uh, th those projects were rental projects, the profile of 
new rental in, in Silicon Valley. That's where it's kind of gravitated. And I think we're dealing with uh, young professionals uh, renting these places in a lot of cases. And that's sort of brought that average square footage down. Um, but like I said, it, you know, it, it's, it's an average. And in that mix is, is sort of studios, ones, twos, maybe three bedrooms. But we have seen um, the sizing gravitate smaller. And um, so, so it's, part, it's matching that market that they see and the successful absorption or rental of, of units around them. And it's also that they can bring the price points down. So it, it, without necessarily lowering the price per square foot. So it's very attractive to, to developers to do smaller units um, because they tend to get a rental rate that is higher on a per square foot basis, making the overall project worth a bit more. So, so I think those are a couple of factors that have driven the, those more compact units. So we've heard that retail, in a sense, needs to be subsidized by other things in order to, quote unquote, pencil out for the developers. So uh, as we look at the options for Valco, uh, what, what are the other things that can subsidize retail other than offices? We're all worried about the office space. So what are the other things getting subsidized retail? Can housing subsidize it enough? What are the other options? Well, the other, uh, so there are, you know, various products that can occur, you know, within the same umbrella. And so, um, you know, any, at the end of the day, there's a, you know, a big spreadsheet and uh, there's going to be, you know, some, you know, if there's some subsidy that's required, uh, often cities require ground floor retail to occur on multifamily, you know, vertical multifamily buildings. Uh, and those, those spaces are, are set as uh, the, the developer expects zero rent from those, from those sites. And so anything you know anything above that is um, you know is is net profit. That means that the um, you know the the residents and the apartments above are paying a portion of their rent for uh, blank retail space on the ground floor. So there's you know a variety of, of ways without getting into the specifics of a particular project. It's hard you know kind of hard to, to to respond to that. There's lots of different ways to do that. I guess the the issue there is from a city standpoint, from a community standpoint. What is the, um, uh, you know, what what it, what what is the amenity? What is the, uh, you know, it's really not the concern so much of how is a private business doing. It's what are you doing for me? What are the services that, that I'm going to uh, want to have in this in the community? What are the uh, opportunities for employment? What are the opportunities for public space around it? Um, I think that that's really kind of where I was driving uh, in in some of the points I made. And let me just add, I mean, so I've, I appreciate the question and actually just in, you know, from Monday through today now, we've, I've received that question in sort of various forms. And it's essentially what's going to drive value at this site? I think the community is, is accepting that, that office is extremely desirable from a market perspective consistent with the presentation. And the, the other main opportunity to create financial value is market rate housing. And so, you know, we, we, when we look at this, because the city's policy is 15% affordable, the SB35 proposal comes with 50% affordable, that really eats into the value creation of the, the housing. So you really are kind of left with office as a, you know, if you're gonna have a significant amount of affordable housing um, biting into the, the value, um, it, it leaves office as a, as a real way to kind of cross subsidize, that create that revenue. And I, I had a really, um, interesting conversation with a Stanford grad student in planning, asking about public finance and public funds, and are there ways that if the community wants a certain project, they can bring other dollars to this to make it happen. And um, that's rare, but, but a possibility as well. Do you want to hold it while yes, I'm standing here? Okay, I am a housewife. I was in tech for 30 years. I got laid off in 2000 and I'm a housewife. 
I am responsible for four seniors in my family, divorced parents remarried that are in their 80s. They all have their own homes and they all have money to burn to shop. They need pennies and they need Sears. Okay, is there, I hear all the time about the only people that are living in Silicon Valley are young tech workers that are 20 to 25. What about all the people over 60 that live here and have money to burn? Where are they supposed to be shopping for clothing? My mother's 85 and doesn't have internet access and she's owned her own home for many years. So I don't see the seniors in the equation here. Um, I do all their shopping and believe me, I pump thousands of dollars into Capitola Shopping Center because we have no Sears left uh, at Valco, and I'm sorry, my mother likes Sears. So your question is the seniors? Yeah, what about the seniors? What about the seniors? They're and, all left out. And left out because they have money to spend. And they need Sears. Okay, can we? I'm sorry, my mother may be stupid, but she likes Sears. <laughs> so, seniors, they have money to spend. Great question. Uh, the, the, um, the older part of the age spectrum typically has more wealth. Um, Sears, I, I'm you know, sorry to inform you, Sears is bankrupt. There is, Sears has disappeared. So uh, there are other, other providers of apparel and general merchandise uh, that are out there that are replacing uh, the department store. Hi. Hi. So, um, so I think we are designing this project for the future. We have housing crisis, they say today, and we have state laws that's encouraging or forcing all the cities to build. Population of Palo Alto will have to double or triple because they have three times more jobs, and population around Great Mall will double. Population in Cupertino will double. And uh, San Jose will be building thousands. Sunnyvale will be building thousands of units. For Cupertino, we don't have just Valco. Both sides of Stevens Creek are already zoned residential. And they can all start building this year, next year. And then west side of the Anza also is already zoned for residential. However, Valco is the only site large enough for a shopping mall, for a population that's going to double or triple in the next few years. Even if online shopping goes to 20% or 30%, you are still looking at a 60 to 80% increase in shopping demands. Valley Fair today is already crowded. Great Mall is crowded. All the shopping, regional shopping malls were built 30 years ago. They are crowded. We have a really good chance to build a unique shopping mall in, at Valco. How about next generation smart mall in Valco that could be, become a destination shopping center that bring in all the shops, shoppers in the valley to Cupertino? It's a central location, you said. Why is that not possible? Why are you not considering that? Okay, would you take a, get the question? Yeah, so point? I think we're good. Um, okay. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the comment. And, and I want to first agree with, with your, your, one of your pieces, which is that this is, you know, as the general plan says, probably the largest, at, you know, site well located in the city. So, so it's a great opportunity for the city to do something, what I, I would say, at scale right, to create essentially a new district of the city. Sure. And so this, this opportunity is kind of a one of a kind, absolutely. Um, and then in terms of retail, I think it's fair to say there will be retail. And what we're here trying to describe is the way retail is evolving away from old models and towards new models. And so by no means are we up here saying you can't have retail. We're up here saying the retail you're likely to get, that the market, and, and, and again, we're strictly sort of market perspective. We're not coming from a policy perspective today. We're, we're coming from an economic and financial perspective. And we're saying that the market probably does not want to invest in a mall. Yes, 
I may. prefer not to have one. Okay. But, but for the TV. Okay. okay. So first I have a clarification, then I have a question. Or a clar I need a clarification. When you showed your food service versus grocery slide and the comment that in 2016 it was the first time that food service became, I'm not sure what term you used, um, but you made a statement that you said eating out is, here's my clarification part. <laughs> you made a statement that more money is spent in eating out than in groceries. To me, that's an assumption that more eating is being done of pre-prepared pre food or prepared food because money spent is based on what is charged and, and there aren't cheap restaurants. I mean, restaurants overcharge all the time. So the amount of money being spent to me, if I just wanna know if you're making an assumption that that means more people are eating out or it's simply that more money is spent because that's two very different things. National Restaurant Association and the Department of Commerce uh, discovered in 2016 that the amount of money Americans spend on uh, prepared food, eating out, exceeded the amount of money they spend on groceries. Okay, so again, that doesn't say that more people are doing it or it's, or it's happening, people are eating out more than they're shopping for groceries and preparing meals at home. It just says more money is being spent, correct? Right. The point, okay. the point of the statistic is that there's a, there's a shift in demographics, a shift in, in shopping preferences that is significant because it, in a, it, it uh, uh, supports more food service, more restaurants uh, in shopping centers uh, than uh, when I was a kid. Uh, there were, uh, most, of, most of your purchases were made you know, in grocery and going out to eat was kind of a special thing. People eat out a lot more now. It's just pretty They pretty do, simple. but there's, yeah. no, there's nothing saying that people are eating out more than they are preparing their own meals. That's my point. And okay. it's like saying more, tes more people are spending money on Teslas than they are on Hyundais. Well, of course, because they're more expensive. So it, it I don't, there's just too many assumptions in that, I would like to say. Okay. Um, and here's the question and a concern. Phasing of projects like this um, is tricky. And if there's not good control over the priorities of what gets per built first and occupied first, often things, I mean, you, you mentioned the new center at Bay Point is being abandoned, it sounds like. You know, where was the phasing? How did that fail in phasing? Or where is the pro issue there? And we, with particular developers who have a history of doing things that are not so great when they're given a little leeway um, and they go back on their word, it's really, really important that that all be understood and what are the priorities in the phases. If, for instance, a green roof is in the mix and we never get there. It, anyway, that. So how is phasing decided? Okay. How does phasing happen? Okay. Well, no, how's it prioritized? Prioritized, okay. And by whom? Well, is that right? You know, it, it's, typically done in a, in a full private setting to kind of establish some critical mass first, create place, right? They need to, to build momentum in the project, right? So a lot of times you'll see the, you know, the 100% corner, the, 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 you know, the, the place where everyone sees they, they, they sort of have a signature first move that, that shows that, you know, there's a certain kind of theme and, themed development coming, right? And it builds on that. And um, so, you know, that'd be pure private. Um, if we find ourselves in a position where there's a development agreement, which might or might not happen, um, the city can have more influence over what they'd like to see first or second or third. Even if we're not in a development agreement framework, uh, there can be conditions of approval on the project that says, along with the first 
phase of office, we also need you to deliver a first phase of housing. And we're not going to approve or issue permits, building permits, for the next phase of office until you've completed your full first phase, forcing the developer to come along in steps that are agreeable to the city. So there are some ways to, to influence contr some control over it. Yeah, I think my points really were uh, phasing is, is seldom done in retail for a variety of reasons. Phasing is done in, in housing uh, to sort, sort of build demand and, 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 and manage the risk of, of, a, of a project. Um, but I think it's important that there, that I was a community development director for a city in, in the Bay Area for 10 years. Uh, the, the city doesn't build anything. The city allows or doesn't allow or, uh, construction on a site. So the decisions about what's going to occur there really are the most important decision is how the capital markets regard the, regard the site and regard the, the potential investment. Uh, and in the case of Five Points up on Candlestick, uh, Mace Rich uh, determined that there was uh, insufficient demand for a shopping center. Was that just a shopping center? Yes. It, it, I mean, it is in the context of a large redevelopment yeah. area. I think so. And, and, and it's an aggressive plan with a tremendous amount of subterranean parking. Right. And it's, you know. Uh, thanks, thanks for your work. Thanks for coming here today. Uh, I also want to thank you. Uh, for recognizing the difference between what the market does and that there is a place for policy. I think that's uh, you know, why the community is being involved in this design process because we're trying to come up with uh, something that's not just market driven but is uh, satisfying the community and that's what policy is about, so thanks. Um, the second one for you, Ben, please. You uh, showed on your slide that 90% of people commute into Cupertino for work. You didn't show that I believe it's about 90% also commute out. So it, it goes both ways. Does, and when you just right. show the one slide, it kind of suggests that, well, we need more housing here so that people won't have to commute so far. And I want to follow that up with something that you told me the other night, but I'd just like you to say it for, for people here. And that is, if you build office here and housing adjacent to it, it's not going to solve our traffic problem because not many of the workers are going to live there. Do you agree with that? OK. No, th so thank you. Um, I. Uh, you, you are correct. We looked at both the in commuting and the out commuting, and, and absolutely, this this is a city where 90% um, come in during the day, and 90% of your working residents commute out. So there's there's traffic both ways. Absolutely correct. Um, and then on building housing near jobs, um, what I said the other night is that uh, I believe we have essentially a nine county Bay Area job market, and that people will travel for the right job. We also have. Uh, uh, some of the highest levels, I think, in history of two income households. So we, we see that uh, oftentimes a family will decide to live midpoint between two job locations. And so it's absolutely true that, that building housing uh, next to jobs is, is not a panacea. Uh, that said, providing housing near jobs could help uh, in terms of, you know, as compared with a, a comparison um, of, of no jobs near the, or excuse me, no housing near those jobs, everyone's forced to commute in. So uh, it, it's a good thing, but it's not the solution to the traffic problem. Thank you. Okay. And my, my last, I don't know if it's a, a comment or a question. You can take it as a question if you want. Um, and this is for both of you, by the way. You, you tended to focus on the, the doom and gloom side of retail. And I think we get it. Retail is, is uh, changing. It, there are challenges. But you, you chose to focus on what's, what's not working or the difficulties. You, I don't even think you mentioned Valley Fair. You know, a couple miles down the highway, currently undergoing a $1 billion expansion. We have examples in Westgate, uh, closer by, $15 million right. recently. Right. Right. Uh, street, right. street level right. stuff that's happening. Right. And with all of this success around, how do you reconcile that with the doom and gloom? And unless you have a compelling story for this, I think myself and other residents are going to continue to believe that retail can stand by itself. It doesn't need office or anything else to subsidize it because we have so many successful examples. So again, that's just a, I, I don't know if you want to answer that, but it, that's more, more a comment. Right. Thank the you. next level of analysis is, and I, I sort of led with, with 
it's not doom and gloom, but there's an oversupply of retail and it's being uh, changing in shape. And so uh, what we're all used to as a shopping center and the shopping experience uh, to a great extent no longer applies. Um, the, uh, the, what has happened uh, certainly since 2008, but, but you know, precursors to that, is that the, uh, you know, like the economy, the retail business is splitting in half uh, so the uh, Class A malls are doing very well. Uh, Santana Row, Valley Fair, um, uh, those high touch and feel places, high yeah. amenity, they're doing very well. We could do that. Federal Realty down in, in Santana Row was, was barely meeting their cost of capital until recently and just things really took off. Um, and uh, at the value end, Mi Pueblo is the grocery store stock to buy. Uh, grocery uh, anchored centers are doing very well and they're trading very well. So if they're well positioned uh, for uh, good value but at the lower price points and the lower service levels and the lower maintenance levels and the lower amenity levels for the community, those centers are doing, are doing very well. What is disappearing is the, the guys in the middle. The Safeways have been, you know, are getting not crushed but a lot of stress from Walmart and Costco, um, you know, and the department stores in the middle, the Pennies and the Sears. Kohl's is doing an interesting play, uh, sort of straddling that. So the market is bifurcating. Um, uh, retail is, you know, by no means a doom and gloom scenario, uh, but it is the shape and size of it is going to be dramatically different. And there are no more. The regional mall is uh, no bo nobody's making those anymore. Thank, thank you for your uh, generosity in that long answer. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the, um, the dollars per square foot, you know, the actual, what are people paying in retail? I would have liked to uh, add to that the context of what does the developer get in dollars per square foot for housing and office space to understand the trade-offs and are we talking two, three, four times? What, what's the order of magnitude that we're talking there? And I'd really like to understand that and would like to have gotten that today in the economics of designing this and developing this from the developer's perspective. Sure. Um, thank you for the comments. So, and I do apologize. On Monday night, I did a slideshow and presented lease rates for all the land uses. I didn't repeat yeah. that tonight. So that's on the, on the record available online for, for uh, your, your viewing. Um, but to answer your question directly, the uh, residential real estate um, garners about 375 to $4 per square foot. So if you have 1,000 square feet, 3750 a month. Um, and what's important to note, though, is that these commercial real estate uh, lease rates are uh, quoted in different ways. So when I say $3.75 a foot for residential, that's all in, right? So they're taking care of the building. Uh, they're taking care of, uh, you know, electric, um, real estate tax, so on and so forth. That's all I pay. When you see these lease rates for retail, it's called triple net, meaning that the, the actual tenant pays all that on top. So you can create an equivalency, but these, these retail lease rates are quite a bit higher than, than residential. Um, an office, it's, it's very similar to residential. It's on the order of $4 a foot, full service, meaning you get everything, all of the building maintenance, um, tax, and insurance in that rate. So uh, the, the lease, lease rates for retail are a bit higher, but I think it's also important to note, Steve was talking a bit about this, that retail is hypersensitive to location, right? So if you've got the best location in Palo Alto, Maybe it's ten dollars a foot. I don't know. You, you tell me, Steve. But twelve dollars a foot. Okay, triple net. So then you're paying all your real estate tax insurance on top of that maintenance. Um, but if you're around the corner on the alley, it might be three, right? So it really, re it's just really important. I mean, we're showing you averages. We're trying to give you a sense of value. But it's very important to to kind of acknowledge that there, there, especially in retail, there's this spectrum of good location to not good location, and it it, is, it has a tremendous effect on these these rates and so um, I'll okay that. and in the housing I, I just have a couple okay. other comments um, in the housing when you are we're talking about housing here is it all expected to be renter as any of that owner occupied condo condominium wise that's, what uh, that's a that's <laughs> a great question because I didn't touch that and I didn't show you any uh, for sale uh, levels um, there's minimal uh, condominium stock in town um, 
It really depends to a great degree on the, the developer's investment model, um, whether they want to be a long-term owner or they maybe want to really do a development deal and sell very quickly. And so it, it's hard to know. Um, there haven't been a tremendous number of condominium projects uh, in this cycle in the Bay Area because values haven't been quite high enough, believe it or not. When you build a condo, it's uh, quite expensive, more so than an apartment. It, but we're getting there. So it, you know they're starting to look feasible. We're seeing more of them. The challenge that developers have, like I said earlier, real estate kind of follows real estate. It's a sort of risk averse. And it's really hard to know what the condos could sell for here. So the risk is kind of high. Um, and so right now, because it's a market that is largely dominated by rental product, we anticipate rental product being more likely. That said, condominiums are a possibility. Okay, and the other thing I'd like to see some discussion of how below market rate really works and how that goes over time. And I don't know if you know, there's other people yeah. that have questions. So, so that I may be something I, I'd, I'd love to bring the city in to talk. Maybe we need a special breakout on um, the housing policy okay. in the city. Um, I know okay. something about it, but uh, just enough to be dangerous. Okay, you've been waiting for a while over here. Are we good for time? I'm fine. Yeah, and we again, I really, really am thankful for everyone's um, time this afternoon. We're, we're now tw oh, 25 minutes over, and Dan knew. Dan said do an hour and a half. I said we only need an hour, so um, yeah. yeah, this is on me. This one is big. Okay. Hi, I want to thank you for providing numbers. We're numbers people here. Um, a city's ability to weather the economic ups and downs it depends on its economic diversity. And um, it's risky for a city to put all its, to be dominated by one employer. That said, when you talk about office, does an office that contains an urgent care, a dentist, doctors, uh, physical therapy, um, pull the same amount of price per square foot um, compared to, a, you know, Somebody else. Yeah. So the, I mean, the discussion about, uh, you know, eating out versus grocery, um, really comes from the questions I get all the time about uh, our shopping centers are changing. The, the, the stores down the street are changing. It used to be a nice apparel store, a small department store with with ladies apparel in it. It's now a dialysis center. Okay. So, medical in some cases there's a is a retail function. And it actually operates as an anchor. And so you'll see many uh, shopping centers are filled, you know, not filled, but you know, have significant uh, medical, office, medical office requirements. Now, there's you know, a difference between a retail medical store and sort of the higher level as you reach up to hospital. The construction requirements are okay, tremendous when you get into to higher levels of care. Um, so uh, the answer to that is they're really good rent payers. And they, uh, you know, they stay. They tend to stay a long time, so they're actually good tenants for the landlord. But they, they may or may not be good tenants for the community. You may want want that urgent care facility here. That's that would be an amenity, and that's the kind of amenity that I was talking about. That, you know, you you could watch out for uh, in terms of you know what the public would demand in in return for the rights to build. Okay, people who haven't spoken yet over here. We're gonna get people who haven't spoken yet. Okay, well, I'll, I'll get to a question. I just wanted to add some more information. Um, so next to Valco, you have the uh, Hamptons Apartments, and they're gonna be going to 942 units. Um, so that's right at the uh, Wolf 280 interchange. Um, at Main Street, you've added 120 units, which have just recently opened up. At 19800 Wolf, um, in the past few years, they added 204 units. Uh, and then if you look at the Valco SB35 application, um, they're adding 2402, and that would add another 6,005 residents. So between these projects, um, I saw that you put a 6% increase in the population between 2007 and 2017. We would be adding 14% about increase in population just in this area with these projects, which is 
huge and imbalanced across the city, and uh, this is the area that I live in. Um, next, looking at the SB 35 application, they dropped the retail portion from 600,000 to 400,000, and there's a letter in there um, discussing the economics of why that needed to drop even further. And of the 400,000, they ended up with 120,000 square feet of entertainment, 147,000 restaurant, and 133,000 square feet of retail, which would be shops. Um, right now, the gym, the Bay Club, is 70,000 square feet. The AMC is 80,000 square feet, plus you have an ice rink and a bowling alley. Um, I don't see how you can add those things up and uh, get under 120,000 without significantly decreasing the sizes of all of those entertainment features, which in these new shopping centers, shopping malls, um, however, whatever you want to call them, uh, because entertainment is, uh, is an important part um, and it is bringing in uh, people, I would not suggest that you would want to decrease your entertainment down to 120,000. Um, and you also have a good portion of the population thinking they're going to get an ice rink and a bowling alley and a theater back. So I don't know how that's going to work. Um, one other part is that when you have that many restaurants, they generate four to ten times the traffic of a straight retail shop. And you're talking about putting 147,000 more restaurants on top of the about maybe 70,000 square feet of restaurants at Main Street. Cupertino. So I guess a couple questions are, is, do you feel that this is responsible development putting 14% of the population increase in such a small area? And do you think that decreasing um, the retail portion, another 200,000 square feet, is going to work with this kind of a population planned? Question. You got the yeah. So, got so the questions? I, right. I want to thank you for the comment, and I and I appreciate you reading the facts into the record. We're being recorded. I think that question is sort of outside the economics and, and finance silo here. I I don't want to respond to that now. We are doing a multidisciplinary process to think about the site holistically. It involves economics and finance, involves transportation, housing policy, and uh, economic development priority, right? Um, so I, I think it's premature to try to answer your question. You're essentially asking if we like the SB 35 application, and I, I can't answer that now. The retail question? Right. Yeah, I, again, I think that the retail is going to respond to the project as a whole. It, you can't just take the retail out and think of it as something totally separate. So. Uh, you know, I think it, it again, the, reading those facts, I, I think those are very similar numbers to what we have. Um, so, you know, those are good data points for us all to be considering, but um, let's, let's plan together. I so I guess the way. answer, may I say the answer is that the, the response to that is coming well, in so our at, proposals? So at the, I mean, at, at the end of this week, we, have, we hope to have alternatives yeah. that, that present a full project with the mix of uses, programming, and what our hope is is that the the retail and the office and the residential will work together economically from a traffic perspective from a placemaking planning and design perspective and so i i'm i'm hopeful that we get there so we're going to get to that we're going to get to that uh yeah i wanted uh to talk about uh sb t uh, the sb 35 proposal and also uh, the initiative, the Valco initiative. Now, those were proposed by the developer as uh, viable projects. Okay, so I guess my question is, the the analysis that you do uh, really should be vetted against, you know, I mean, the methodologies and whatever that you're going to use should be vetted against those two projects, you know, so that so that you, you know. Uh, what's the right word? So that you don't, money isn't left on the table with respect to uh, value to the community. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, so so that, that's right. Um, I think that we we need to consider this current applicant proposal. It's highly relevant. It's it's the uh, backstop. It's where we'll end up if we don't do anything. Probably that's you know, or at least that's what they're um, presenting to us. 
Uh, so yes, uh, you know, when, when that came out and we we're talking internally with our planning team, what we said is that that is the right reference point. We need to think about trade-offs against that. You know, if we don't like the heights, what can we give them? If we don't think there's enough retail, what can we give them to create value to offset those things? And in terms of, uh, so, so, so yeah, let's, let's keep it in mind. And in terms of um, the, uh, you know, let's make sure we get every drop of community benefit out of the project that we can. Um, I think that's a, it's a good goal. It's a lofty goal. We want this to be the best project it can be, project itself. We want it to bring community amenities for sure. Um, I just think it's important that we all acknowledge that the financial pro forma, right, that the developer runs is a business model. A lot of times we get into these community benefit negotiations and it's described a calculator. I'm going to turn the crank, it's going to tell me they can spend another $10 million. But it's, it's not that precise. It, 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 there's a lot of upside and downside potential in the market. And what we're doing is providing, again, a, a business plan. If you ever have started a business, you know sometimes things go your way, sometimes they don't. And so we're shooting for an expected value and we want to be reasonable about asking for community benefits without going so far that the project never gets built. Because I've certainly worked for cities that have approved projects that ask for too many community benefits and never got built. Okay, so my question might be that we'll know, or you can't answer it right now, but I was wondering if there were rules of thumb that we could perhaps understand from you that sort of guide these kinds of trade-offs, uh, com community benefits being more like money paid as opposed to money profit, right? We do know that the developer does need to make profit in the end. Um, and so I was just wondering, there are lots of expectations. They've been enumerated around uh, everything from a below market rate housing to a community center to skating rink and a variety of other things. Are there rules of thumb you can share that might help in the long run to ameliorate any, say, disappointments that might happen given that everybody has a different idea of what the perfect mall is going to be, perfect, excuse me, development is going to be? period. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. I, and I think I uh, understand your question. And, and I, I think based, you know, building on a few of the comments that have been made. So what, what drives value? Should we be considering SB 35? I think, you know, this, this is in the realm of that. And, and what we know is that the market values this office space tremendously. And, and unfortunately, that's not necessarily aligned with the desires of the community. And that's the, that's the friction we've got going. Um, so, so to the degree you're willing to, to, you know, give a little office to get a little something else you want, that, that'll work. I think below market rate housing is the other major lever. Um, that 50% that level of below market rate housing is tremendously expensive, okay? And, and it's not clear if you, I, I actually I'm pretty certain that if you didn't have cross subsidy, that's not possible. The two SB 35 projects that I know of in Northern California both come with a significant other revenue driver that makes that 50% affordable possible. Okay, so, so to the degree we, we want to bring down affordable housing a little bit, you can get more of what you, you know, other things you want that aren't necessarily revenue drivers. And I also want to point out this, it's, it's relevant, and I haven't mentioned it um, yet, but one of the real challenges with this site is um, it costs a tremendous amount of money for the applicant to acquire the site. And so, so and, and, and this is a problem with malls, and, and maybe Steve will have more thoughts on this, but they, they're, they're usually extremely complicated disparate ownership, right? All kinds of different entities have a different stake in it. They, some own signage, some own parking, some own the box, some own the common area, you know, it's, and so to acquire and assemble a site like this costs these guys $320 million. And if they want to make a return on that investment, they have to do something very significant. Okay, let's see, hands up are, are people who've spoken, anybody not spoken yet that wants, wants to speak? Okay, then we'll go. One, two, three, and then we'll end it, okay? Is that good? Yeah, well, they, they want it on the record. <laughs> okay, so you talked about this being a holistic process and the components being considered. The list of components, traffic, economics, retail, didn't include the environment, natural resources, 
or the entirety of infrastructure. That's a huge hole in what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where that comes in. And the other, so maybe you can answer, where does that come in? And how is it valued in this process? And, the, and Monday night, um, there was a reference to, oh, we looked at the general plan and we see that there's some parallels here that we should be paying attention to. There was even reference, speaking of natural resources and, and the environment, there was reference to the trees and how valuable the trees are in the area. I can guarantee you those trees are, we were promised the trees at Main Street, the trees are all gone. Um, so I just want you to hear your own words and I think it's very important that it's understood and people are, may misinterpret this, but community benefits is a buzzword that's never defined. It was actually taken out of our general plan, which I want you all to know when it was amended, deliberately taken out because of input from the city that community benefits never really turn out to be what they claim they're gonna be so a project could stand on its own. And in a project like this, where you're gonna have this contain, well, I shouldn't say this because I'm referring to what Valco want, or Sand Hill wants, not necessarily what you guys are gonna come to, which is very hard, obviously, for people right now. But if you come to a project that's anywhere, anywhere close, 50% of what is hoped for the developer, you, the project is sort of a city among itself. Any amenities in there are really, in my opinion, more focused on whoever's gonna live and work there on those 53 acres, not for the rest of the community. So it is not a whole or a holistic community benefit. And again, please take note that when the amendment to the general plan was being done, there were all these community benefit, community benefit, they were all stricken from the text. And you can confirm that with the city and there were reasons for it. So to continue to push community benefits, I think you need to be very careful. And once again, there's never been a definition, just like they never define retail. They never define, anyway. In there earlier <laughs> so, so yeah no I, I think again thank you for the comments and reading them into the record I, you know and um, I would just urge you to, to join us in the studio to bring up concerns about uh, environment um, you know lead buildings infrastructure uh, you know anything that you feel is missing from the discussions please raise them in the in the uh, in the planning workshop, th we were here today, I mean, I, I absolutely take your point, and I was providing some examples of a multifaceted process, but, but come to the room where all the experts, are, or all the consultants, rather, are, are discussing this and, 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 you know, get it on the radar, and, and that's, that's great. We I'll appreciate just, that. I'll, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just say that if you come over to the studio and see what's going on, there's, there's going to be, it, it, the environmental component of it is going to be definitely integrated into this project. Okay, to add, there's a thing in the general plan about view preservation. We're supposed to preserve our views. So views. I think the heights are and in fact, Yeah, well, I think they're, yeah. running, they're running a separate CEQA process, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. anyway, right. views, uh, uh, come over and see how we're doing. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna try and keep so you guys First, a comment uh, related to what I said earlier. The reason we are in this housing crisis is that decisions were made by market force. So cities overbuilt office, and now we have housing shortage. We are asking people, we are asking where will people live right now? Many people will live in high rise with very little living space. Many p in if we are short-sighted and feed market or current need today in our planning decision, soon we are going to be asking, where will people shop, entertain, and interact with others? There will be no space for them. So then I have a question on retail. I think we spoke on Monday where you confirmed that overall retail sale 
is going up. It grew by 34% last year, and it has been growing the, in the past few years, even though there were thousands of stores closing. And the retail job market is also holding strong, which means there are new trends opening, new shops opening every day. Now, my question is for Cupertino, mixed use retail hasn't been working well. And I heard from other re rental retail leasing agencies, mixed use is very hard to design. There are a lot of issues. It's very hard to lease. But you know, if, if we want to build something that really attract people, it's better to have a big, an area with critical mass of retail, like a shopping mall, original shopping mall, that we have a mix of stores. People can come and they can feel they can shop, they can dine, they can meet with friends, do a lot of things. And mixed use. So I, I, I want to know why do you, your view of mixed use in Cupertino, in Silicon Valley, versus, um, High I guess, a shopping experience um, that may be not stack pack mixed use, but uh, like you said, the horizontal mixed use. So mixed use. Did you get, and, yeah. did you get a question out of that? Yeah, I, the, the question is, okay. is uh, uh, so mixed use is a form. This is what I was referring to. It is a form that has recently, recently evolved um, in specialized markets where um, uh, there are uh, 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 vertical, vertical uh, residential buildings being being constructed, and uh, for there are two reasons why you you encounter mixed use on the ground floor. Uh, one is that this, the cities, uh, the municipalities require they do not want to give up the street uh, to a a residential floor or or a or leasing office, a blank space. They want to activate the street, so they require retail on the ground floor. Um, the other reason is that the developer of the residential building um, wants to provide retail on the ground floor as an amenity to the you know to his, to his uh, residents up upstairs and that's a, a kind of a classic master planning uh, strategy where you would have uh, sort of when we were building suburbs in the state there would be a shopping area then there would be homes uh, so you need to pr provide a com as if you're a large developer and you provide a, a, a more of a complete living experience including some amount of shopping um, it because of how we do planning in this state it is very expensive to build these big these residential buildings and so the the, the companies that typically build those are really good at building apartments that sell and apartments that rent and and they're they're manageable um, they're not good at retail and our company i've worked on projects our company helps those companies do better at their ground floor retail by recruiting the right tenants by making sure that the right amount of of um, electric power and circulation and utilities are there but it's still not a the kind of environment that a sort of a classic retailer would go into. The floor plates are not big enough. It's a it's it's a bad fit given how the how our building culture in this in this state has evolved. And so very frequently you'll fee, you'll see them empty. Or you'll see substandard tenants, uh, and uh, nobody's happy about that. So uh, it's a challenge, and it takes skill and uh, good you know good you know good execution to do that. It is very rarely that, uh, frankly, that cities have been helpful in, it, they don't have the ability to help out that, you know, that situation. The other, so, the, um, the uh, so that's why I'm, okay. I'm kind that's of pleading one. to understand the retail industry today and the formats it's demanding and how people really shop. I think the, the ideal, the, the perfect retail environment is the flea market. It's very cheap to, to, uh, to be a vendor there, uh, and the, there's just like tents, and uh, you can sell your stuff and everybody shows up. And uh, so that's a, um, I'm not suggesting a flea market for Valco, um, but the, you, have to, you have to stand back and look at all the different forms 
from flea market to big building to shopping center to regional mall uh, in order to get clear on what it is you want to ask for. That was really my point. You had a question for Ben? Well, I, just, I also want to add on, I mean, yeah. it, Steve, Steve makes the comment about the flea market, and it has me thinking of this Transbay Terminal in San Francisco that's just opening up with a tremendous amount of retail that, that the city probably doesn't need. And how are the retail real estate entities trying to do this? They do it with pop-ups, right. right? They're not going to fully invest in this retail at first. They're going to come out with these pop-up stores, which are very low cost, get proof of concept, Estab get the place on the map, you know, that kind of thing. And so, it, you know, maybe that was an extreme example, but, but I think it makes a great point about, uh, about how hard it is to get retail going. And that's a horizontal retail, that's a horizontal mixed use option, right? No, oh, so it's a it's a bus terminal it <laughs> that separates, might have high speed rail one day. It separates. You were asking about horizontal, mixing, and that's right? you know it's an urban condition as well. So, I I could you please confirm that we discussed on Monday because people are the the, the retail sale regarding the figure for retail sale and the okay. I think retail market. Agree. So, okay. so I had recently read some CBRE research that suggested that total retail sales are not in decline. They're, they're actually growing slowly, and I don't know, would you agree with that? Yeah, and so, the, so, so I think Steve here agrees we can, we can okay. pull some of those data, uh, but, but yeah, I don't think anyone's gonna argue that, that as a um, nation we're spending less money on, on goods. Okay, and we're going to, I think this will be wrap it up unless you, she had something about the flea market, but uh, I went there. Okay, I wanted to add a little more uh, data. So you mentioned it was, uh, I believe, about 320 million to buy the the mall in 2014. Even with a 66 percent occupancy rate, the mall had 99 million in estimate, estimated uh, taxable sales. Um, I would suggest. Uh, Anybody interested in this, the San Jose Market Overview and Employment Lands Analysis from January 20th, 2016. Um, in it, they go over the um, urban villages. They go over the urban villages and particularly the Stevens Creek urban village, which extends into Cupertino as uh, potential, high potential, I should say, for um, retail. Um, so that's right on our border, and also the Danza um, Avenue uh, Boulevard, they're um, looking to add more retail um, in that area. Uh, for retail sales um, in western San Jose, 399 average sales per square foot. The mall was only making 124, but again, that was at the 66% um, occupancy. Valco, um, I should say, um, Santana Row makes 400 to 600 uh, per square foot. Uh, Trader Joe's makes 1,700, a little over 1,700 per square foot. It does really well. Apple stores do 6,000 a square foot. That's beautiful. <laughs> but we don't have one in the mall. Um, so also about the developer, um, one of the early designs for Main Street retail was 150,000. There was gonna be an athletic club of 145,000 with an in-ground pool, 100,000 of office and 160 senior residential units, 150 hotel rooms. It ended up being 130,500 retail, no athletic club, 260,000 square feet of office and 120 market rate apartments. 180 hotel rooms, so there is some uh, um, reasonable um, lack of trust, perhaps, with what we're going to end up with. And then I want to, um, I guess, throw a yellow flag on the phasing. This is the underground parking. You mentioned residential, office residential, perhaps, and what that sounds like to me, because they're going to scour the whole site and put um, at least two stores, uh, stories of underground parking. Um, what it looks like is that you're describing that they would take the eastern side and build that out first, leaving us the, um, the, uh, the little bit of retail that's still viable on the, um, the western portion. So um, my concern is that the way they've been designing this, that they won't be able to actually phase it. They'll build one half of the project and then the other. Um, and that will be left basically with no retail for a good bit of time. Okay. You got a question um, about that? So, so just real quick, <laughs> thank you for the citations, the references to some of those reports. Um, 
Very good. And uh, I think as far as I recall, your numbers are very much in line with the numbers we have. So good to read those out and make sure we're all kind of agreeing on the same facts. I think that's a big role we have here is making sure we are working with common data. Um, and then real quick on the phasing, you know, like I said, the infrastructure can be chunky. I'm working on a site on the San Francisco waterfront that requires deep dynamic compaction. Yeah, they have to come in and do basically half the site and to do the other half the site. So it's not going to be perfectly phased, but in terms of the risk associated with vertical construction, that may be more manageable in smaller bites. But um, thank you for your comments. It's easy. What is it? So, you know, I, I thank you. I think that supports my point that, that it's important to get clear on how people are living today in, in order to ask for what you want in terms of being an, uh, an addition to the community. It's not risk management so much as there's an, an increment to the city proposed to be built. How does that increment add to and benefit the city in, in what ways? And if, if farmer's market is a place where people get together and show up and spend their public civic time, then that is an amenity that, um, you know, is, is worth speaking. I'm, I don't speak for any of those people. Okay. Let's thank these guys for working hard. Tomorrow is form-based codes. So please have people come to that one. We understand there was like different ideas of what is this form-based code stuff about? You're going to get the real answer tomorrow at noon. Thank you very much. All right. Good to see you. Good to get another question. Okay. So.